Welcome back to Tyrants on the Field. As always, I'm your host, Joe. Excited to be back. Uh, in today's episode, we are going to go deep on Battle Forge scenarios. Uh, for those that don't know what a Battle Forge scenario is, uh, you should start paying uh, the $4.99 for the monthly app uh, from War Machine. So one of the benefits that you get when you do subscribe to the app is you get a whole bunch of access to a lot of fluff uh, and to uh, a lot of different scenarios. Uh, one of the scenario types that you get access to are called Battle Forge scenarios. And Battle Forge scenarios are an extremely interesting and new type of way to play War Machine from a uh, gaming standpoint. I would say they are narrative uh, gaming scenarios on a bit of steroids. I think that there is some uh, very interesting design going on in them, uh, which we'll talk about further within the episode. Uh, additionally, I want to talk about some of the things that are going on on the channel for the YouTube, as well as sort of plans uh, going forward with everything. So a lot of good stuff in today's episode, but of course, first, we start everything off with a word from our sponsors. Kids, are you ready for an epic adventure? Well, introducing Production Delays, the thrilling new tabletop game from Privateer Press. Yes, I've got the perfect strategy. Watch out. Here comes the move. In production delays, you command mighty armies, lead powerful factions, and challenge your friends to exciting battles. Only you don't because your models aren't there yet. Production delays throws unexpected challenges your ways. You'll face resource shortages, unpredictable events, even sabotage. Oh no, my plans just got delayed. Better not update the community. Ha <laughs> ha, who would have saw that coming? Well, you just have to adapt and overcome. The key to victory lies in your ability to strategize, improvise, and think on your feet. Also to be completely uncommunicative. And the best part? Production Delays is brought to you by Privateer Press, the renowned creator of captivating tabletop games, including War Machine. With over 20 years experience in production delays, Privateer Press delivers an engaging and immersive experience where you'll feel like your stuff just isn't getting to you. So gather your friends, unleash your imaginations, and get ready for a gaming experience unlike any other, because it's just not ready yet. Privateer Press games are the best, especially when you can't get access to them, because production delays. Try production delays today. Brought to you by Privateer Press where epic adventures begin when they arrive, eventually. Brought to you by the Commission to Restore IOS. I will say, all of the uh, unfortunate production delays uh, do absolutely suck. And as somebody that's waiting on uh, dust to come out, I am uh, I am heartbroken that it's, it's going to be longer, and it makes me sad on the inside. Uh, so we are hoping that everything gets righted uh, as quickly as it can and uh, they find their feet fully. Um, very impressed with the, the sculpts that we've been getting out. As an Orgoth player, I have my expansion. Very excited for that. Looking forward to my 80 mil models uh, and looking forward to everybody getting everything that they, they want uh, so that we can get on and get some new Hordes factions, which would be sweet. So very exciting stuff, um, but did just want to have a little bit of tongue-in-cheek with uh, you know the fact that things aren't moving as quickly as we'd all like so and I'm, I'm sure privateer is right at the, the top of that list so all of that said let's talk about battle forged scenarios so again with this subscription and i i hope that uh if you find value in it you're subscribing i find a, a lot of value uh in the subscription because of the ancillary pieces like the fiction the uh the compendiums that come out, as well as uh, the Hero and Villains pieces. But the, the real value that I get are from uh, the release of the Black Tide campaign, um, 
we're getting into our second season of Black Tide campaign, which is super exciting. Some really interesting scenarios in uh, the new portion of the packet, the, the season two, which corresponds to the Resurrection League. Um, all of which you'll start to see on the channel. Um, that's sort of like the, the next focus point of the channel is we'll be doing um, a Resurrection League and we will be focusing on uh, the scenarios that are coming in Black Tide Season 2, which is uh, which is really exciting to, to have there. Um, some really good scenarios. And speaking of some really good scenarios, let's talk about Battleforge. So what is Battleforge? Battleforge, by its own, admi own admission, is a sandbox way to play War Machine uh, that Privateer Press has given. There are a couple of really interesting elements in Battleforge. Uh, first and foremost, they have uh, extensive terrain elements that they discuss in the in the Battleforge scenarios. So you have um, a lot of barriers, you have buildings, you have forests that are big and small, you have obstacles that are big and small, you have hills or what they are now calling plateaus uh, that are both small and large with particular dimensions around them. Uh, you have ponds that are large and small, you have rubble fields, you have trenches. So all, all of the stuff that we have grown to know and love but Battleforge kind of kicks it up to 11. And in one of the things that they do in a Battleforge scenario is they provide a pre-designed map um, for your terrain elements. You do not have to place your terrain elements in the same way that they do. It is recommended that you do, uh, or you go get as close to that as possible, but you can mix it up and change it. What is not recommended that you do is that in some of these scenarios, the majority of the scenarios, there will be a certain type of terrain feature that will become scoring. And so you will then have to either uh, take and hold that or contest it uh, in, order to, in order to score. And so that becomes really interesting because then instead of having this abstract um, zone, you now have a finite piece of terrain with defined features that is variable based on the terrain that you have available to you um, so that you can sort of determine your fun um, and get a, a very interesting setup uh, in that. And when I talk about higher volumes of terrain, um, when we look at a standard steamroller, a standard steamroller has about eight pieces of terrain on the board typically um, before any defense or any of that. Uh, when I talk about Hoist the Colors, um, which is one that we just did a battle report of, it's up on the up on the YouTube now, you're looking at about 20 pieces of terrain on the table. So we're talking a significant portion of terrain. We're talking four rubble fields, two buildings, four small obstructions, um, six walls, four forests, two small hills, one large hill, two ponds. So just terrain everywhere on the board. And what it does is it really it makes things like Pathfinder more valuable. Um, it's, an, it's innately designed to do those type of things because of the volume the terrain's on the board. Uh, also means that there's more access to cover on the board. Uh, and sort of the thing that we see in current steamroller is that you go first and you shove everything forward and then the opponent has a real hard time being able to, to effectively shove you back. Uh, this sort of interrupts your movement in a lot of ways. Uh, it puts again a, a higher, higher valuation on uh, mobility. Uh, not that mobility isn't always something that we seek even in, in a steamroller packet, but it really puts a premium on it. And you really feel if you're not able to maneuver around the battlefield as effectively. Um, that's, that's at least the intention with how these uh, preset maps are, are sort of dictated. Uh, then we get some interesting changes to scoring itself. So again, 
in Hoist the Colors, you see that there is uh, a little bit, little bit of a change to how we typically score. In a typical steamroller, um, each zone or element is typically worth one, uh, is worth one point. Here, there is an escalated scoring scale, meaning you score none for something that is on your side of the table, a hill that's on your side of the table, you don't score any points for. But controlling it, which means having two uh, warrior models on it to control it with no, no enemies contesting, meaning no enemies on it, If you control all three of the hills in the scenario with, again, two warriors upon each, you win. If you control the hill on your side of the field, you score no points. You score the If you have the control of the hill in the middle, you score one point. And if you have control of your opponent's hill, you score three points. So there's a, a strong escalation factor there. Additionally, that's our main scenario is we have these three hills with that scoring type. Then we add mission modifiers. So these are two rolls that occur at the start of the game. Uh, you basically roll a d3 for each and then uh, what's rolled becomes what's available or what is picked at the table. So some of the mission modifiers are held at bay, secure the perimeter, and territory control. And held at bay uh, has a scoring timing. So beginning of the third round, you score one victory point. At the beginning of your turn, if your opponent's leader is within 12 of the near edge of their deployment zone. That's another key factor in Battle Forge scenarios. Battle Forge scoring timing, very different. And I, I like it quite a bit. Uh, you score at the start of your turn. That is when scoring occurs. So when it's your turn, uh, we check for scoring at the very start. Additionally, we do not check for victory until the end of the second player's turn. So if an opponent has completed a, 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 a victory condition, game doesn't immediately end. The game only, immediate, a game only ends after the second player's turn. So if the second, second player will execute their turn after you've achieved your victory condition, they will then have a chance to deny you that victory condition or get a victory condition that is higher on the victory check chart. And we'll go over that in a moment. And then you also will, will roll for achievements, uh, which is, again, things like Big Game Hunter, uh, Bloodletting, or Exterminator. But we do a victory check, and the victory check is in the following order. Decisive win. At the end of any of the second player's turns, a player holding all three hills wins the match. Second tier of victory. Point advantage. At the end of any of the second player's turns, a player with five or more victory points than their opponent wins the match. Victory condition three. Last leader win. The end of any second player's turn, a player with the last leader model in play wins the match. What this means is that, yes, you can win by assassination, but it is not immediate, and if the opponent can outscore you in victory points, the victory points take precedent. Again, because it's not checked until that end of that second player's turn. And then, uh, additionally, there is a victory point win, which is if neither leader is in play, and at the end of any second player's turn, the player with the most victory points wins the match. So what this means is, if you've killed my caster, and I have more victory points than you, or can score more victory points at the end, or, 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 or I, and I have more victory points than you, but I don't have a differential of five, I then have to assassinate your caster. And if I do that, and I'm the second player, I will win the game, because the victory is not checked, the second player's turn. There is no leaders in play. So we go around to that fourth victory fourth victory condition of most points win. So that is the crux of the structure of Battle Forge scenarios. They are highly terrain 
dependent, meaning you're going to have a high volume of terrain. They're going to have a terrain scoring element to them. So there's going to be uh, things that are going to be a, a terrain element that acts as a zone does or as an objective. And you're going to have uh, a different timing chart for victory than you're used to with different tiers of victory. Uh, meaning, if you if you can win by the main mission objective, you have the, the highest degree of victory. Otherwise, uh, it goes to that second tier of victory, then the third tier, then the fourth tier. So a little more complex than, than a standard steamroller, but not much, not, not overly difficult to comprehend. So what does all this mean? It's, it's a super cool area to sort of plan. Uh, the missions range between ones that are optimized for 50 to 75 or 75 to 100. Um, there's one in there that is designed specifically for the 35-point scout uh, mission, which is kind of a, a neat one to, to play with people that are just starting out. It's not overly fun for for a, an experienced player, but that's just that's just me. Um, for me, uh, I've really enjoyed um, the ones like Host, Hoist the Colors, uh, the one that just came out uh, a week or so ago. We're going to be doing a report on, which is. which is holdout. Um, so interested to give that one a try. You, you'll probably see that one on the channel as well. But I want to bring this into a, a broader discussion about what they're doing. Uh, and by they, I mean Privateer Press's design team. I, I have some theories on Battleforge um, that I've shared pretty detailed in a blog post that I've done. Yeah, we have a blog as well. So you, you're more than welcome to check that out. Uh, for all things tyrants on the field so one of the there's a lot of really great design elements in battleforge that i like and that i think are being used as test grounds for what will evolve steamroller for mark IV. so let's talk about first thing first thing we'll do is let's talk about what i love about the battleforge scenarios one I am a huge fan of having terrain as our replacement for zones. I think it makes sense. I think it's scalable. I think it lets uh, people get in very easily. I think you can standardize it uh, across a tournament scene in that way, in the same way that we had uh, zones before, because of how they have detailed you know, what is small, what is large, and the community will probably determine what small and large uh, range within that size we want to make standardized. But even if you don't standardize it, as long as it's defined on the table that you're playing at, it's a fair game. So I like that quite a bit. I like the general concept of holding a hill or holding something being based on unit type and having warrior type be what's what's utilized uh, because that that gives a, a job for solos but doesn't create a dependency for solos uh, which is a, a very good thing in this edition um, additionally two seems about right for sort of how infantry tend to survive in my in my experience with the game um, it, it gives you a chance to to knock out a unit from being fully scoring. It's got to have a friend if you get it down to one one item, but it, you can't do a cheeky, you know, one guy's in there and, and owning it uh, anymore. He's got to have a friend. So I like that. Uh, I absolutely adore having secondary and tertiary scoring elements. Um being either determined randomly or, or having a list and, and eventually allowing players to pick. Um, I, I'm a fan of, of the D3 in that situation. It's really easy just to convert your starting role into you know, the secondary and tertiary. 
um, objective if you want to it saves your role you don't have to do it that way that's just what I've been doing because um, it, it's worked uh, pretty well for us doing it that way and it, what it does is it means you can create one scenario that then has all of these branches uh, basically six branches that it can go down so that there is not um, a rush or a race to a fully optimized strategy on that scenario uh, it means that there's diversity in the scenario play because uh, a game with big game hunter uh, which gives you an opportunity to earn three points for your caster melee killing a enemy cohort model is going to play is going to play and be played very differently than a scenario where you have rolled where you have rolled bloodletting, uh, which is you gain one victory point the first time one of your models damages an enemy leader with an attack each turn. So that those two play styles very differently. Uh, or th those two achievements very different in the game that that's going to produce uh, in terms of what is going to provide you scoring uh, the opportunities you have for a big swing in a big game hunter game are a lot more than in a bloodletting game uh, additionally the mission modifiers same way held at bay you want to keep people off of your side of the table at least get it cleared by turn three in order to start scoring points uh, versus territory control you're going to divide the table into four 24 by 24 quadrants and you score a victory point for every quadrant you dominate at the beginning of your turn you dominate by having more models than your opponent does in a particular quadrant so that means you want to spread out and it really doesn't matter what your opponent does as long as you can outnumber them in more quadrants you will score um, additional points so it changes the way that you're going to play and approach these scenarios. And I, I love that because it adds scenario variety without adding additional scenario complexity. And as a designer, that's really what you want to do. You want to add some variety. You want to add some depth. You want to avoid first order strategies uh, being, being the dominant strategy. And simple mission modifiers can can do this quite a bit and again i i'm no no secrets i i've worked with and on malifo for a very long time and one of the things i love and appreciate about that game is the way that its secondary scoring was was integral to how you won games and how you played the game and how every time your your scenario was just a little bit different because of the schemes that were involved and the armies that were involved and the way that those two two things interact so to have a, a small portion of that come into war machine i i'm very excited for it i really hope that it is considered for part of the new steamroller because i think it provides longevity to the steamroller provides interest to the players it provides a, a level of depth that is needed without adding much complexity at all it's pretty easy to understand you're going to have an extra rule of how to score and you're going to roll a dice to do that um, i love the win condition being moved to the second player's turn it provides power to the second player because the second player is going to see uh it, it has the it has the control on victory so I, as if you are first player, yes, you get a first player advantage, but you do not have the ability to end the game. You have the ability to create a condition where after the second player does a reaction to you, uh, they that you may end the game, but it doesn't immediately end when you do something. The opponent then has an ability to react. The second player advantage is if I set my win condition at the end of my turn, it's over. The first player will not get a response that's a pretty nice balancing mechanism uh, and and something that i think is going to really be appreciated by players as they sort of think about that and i, I want to make sure people are, are thinking about this because it's really 
interesting. The other thing is I love having a tiered victory chart. Basically, it's a timed victory chart. So you have something that causes the highest level of victory, so then you don't look at any of the other victory conditions. Then you go to the second one. If the first one wasn't met, you go to the second one. Second one wasn't met, you go to the third. Third one wasn't met, you go to the fourth. This, I think, is one of the most powerful things they could bring into Steamroller. Because, again, it balances out a bit of first player advantage because second player is, is going to be is going to have an ability to go, okay, you've done X, which puts you at this, 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 this tier. So I have to react to it. Either I have to get you off of those hills in the, in the case of, of hoist the colors or get you off that objective or, or score, or I have to score, uh, you know, another point to, to stop this from occurring, or I need to, a, you know, score a point and then assassinate you, and then I can can get a victory condition there, or I have to get on the hills. You know, there's he provides option and and play trees for the second player. Um, that that's something. If they take nothing else, that that is my wish that they bring is a timing chart for victory, and the movement of the victory condition check only at the second player's end of the second player's turn. Uh, I'm also a big fan of, of moving the scoring to the, the start of the turn. Um, big, big fan of that. Uh, that just makes it very simple uh, to do. You don't have this end of turn um, calculation that you have to do. It's it's essentially the same, but we, we've already clicked over into the new turn. Um, so I, I like that uh, immensely. So that that's the parts of Battleforge that I, that I really like. Um, I also really like an upping of the terrain density on the table. I am not a huge fan of preset tables. Uh, and for a couple reasons, number one, uh, as you'll see in my battle report, the, the volume of terrain is very interesting and I, and I like it a lot. The need to be able to scale that is going to be immensely difficult for uh, a standard TO to be able to do, um, at least at least initially. Um, so what I would like to see and what I would suggest to Privateer is to up the terrain count from 8 to 12 per table, um, at least at the start, with a goal of eventually getting to more elements than that on the table, getting it to around that 20-ish elements on the table over time. But I, I think in, in the first year of this, uh, and I mean uh, of a new steamroller, we need to up the, the, t the, up the terrain requirements slightly. Again, I, I don't want to sticker shock anybody. I don't want to put too much pressure on TOs. Um, if you've got a good community, good idea to do um some terrain some terrain days probably a great idea uh additionally we as a community need to get better at supporting tos in general um events don't happen without our without our tos and if we've got to got to do some things to help them out we should probably be doing those things. And, and I'm, I include myself in people that need to do better with the support of their TO. So that's a slight, a slight, a slight side tangent on that. So I would like to see terrain increased. I am not a fan of predetermined maps for a, a couple of reasons. Number one, the a predetermined map um, puts an undue burden on... Uh, the terrain organizers, uh, the event organizers as, as a whole, and we do want to have flexibility in our ability to play this game and adapt them to the terrain that a community may have or have access to. So I don't think it's unreasonable to have things like hills as objectives or ponds as Ponds as objectives or, or as or as scoring elements, I think those type of things are fine. Uh, what I'm more 
leaning towards and stating that I would like to see some decorum on. It's just the volume of scatter uh, terrain that they've added to some of these preset maps. Uh, I, I think it's fine to, to set the set an example map of what it could look like, but not necessarily that that's what you have to play in order to play the scenario. And they, and they do do a good job in the actual reading of it to say, you can change the terrain as you need. You just want to keep these scoring elements in these locations, which makes total sense. You know, we have we have that sort of day, that's sort of the, the pinnacle and, and standard for Steamroller. This just also gives you sort of a terrain mapping. That, that said, I, I am for more terrain. I am not for 25 pieces of terrain on every single table. That is, that's not feasible at the scale that War Machine tends to get played when the community is fully engaged. So, how do we, how do we it better engage? So, let's talk about the problems with current Steamroller and why why it makes me think that they're experimenting a bit in Battleforge. Well, a couple of things. First and foremost, the current Steamroller was designed with a much larger game in mind. Uh, we were talking about it, we talking about a time when units were 12, 13 models uh, in size. We're now at a, a, now at a spectrum where a large, a large unit is seven models. It's a very different scale. Uh, Additionally, you have cohort models taking up much more of the points on the field than they did under previous editions. You also are not getting free solos like you did in third edition. So the volume of stuff that you had in a standard game uh, in Mark III is reduced by about a third in... Mark IV, even at 100 points. Even at 100 points, we're moving less models than we were before. So let's let's not make any illusions that we aren't. Doesn't mean you can't have a high model count game. Wolf exists. Uh, Pirates exist. There, there's a lot of ways to get a high model count if you want, if that's your play style. My, heck, even my, my new Kator uh, one is a pretty significant amount of, amount of infantry on the field when I want to, but it's it's not 10 models per unit, not 10, 12 models per unit. So the old zone sizes are cavernous in this edition. That means that, again, you can run up on turn one, because, again, the sparsity of the terrain, and begin to dominate that area very quickly. First, first player has a major advantage, which puts a real onus on the TO to make a table that has um, a very imbalanced terrain placement, which makes sense. I mean, that's part of part of the game is is choosing the ground on which to fight. Um, so you don't want a lot of asymmetry there. So that that presupposes that people are going to be asymmetric in their in their placement it doesn't always happen that way so one of the other issues with because it was designed with larger games in mind is it feels slightly better to play at 100 points than it does at 75 points in these scenarios uh, again because they are so cavernous and you're dealing across such a wide swath of board that losses at 75 mean that the scenario can get overrun very rapidly. At 100 points, there's a bit more of a shove and shove back uh, across the scenario. You can play wider generally. So it feels, it feels better, but it doesn't feel like you're playing a Mark IV game, if that makes sense. It, it, it feels very much like these scenarios are a relic of a previous era, because they are. And when I play Battleforge scenarios, and when I play some of the scenarios in the Resurrection League, uh, i.e., uh, i.e. The, the the Resurrection League, those you'll see and you'll look at and you'll go, this feels like a Mark IV Steamroller scenario. At least some of them do. 
uh, not all. Um, when I look at hoist the colors, again, you can check it out on the YouTube channel. When I look at hoist the colors, I feel very much that that feels like a steamroller scenario where there's a, there's a back and forth, there is a swashbuckling that is occurring, there are moments and minutes where, depending on the choices that are made, there can be big swings in uh, who's going to win, and then there's a swing back. There's a lot of play and counterplay uh, because of the nature of that sco- nature of the scoring, the ability to, or the the reason the game doesn't end until the second player's end of the second player's turn. Scoring is at the start of your turn. There's a lot of things to, to think about it and swash through, and it makes for a very engaging game, even if you're only playing at 75, uh, which is where I think for the health of the game, we should be at longer term. Um, I, I love playing at 100. I'm going to play at 100 this weekend in Toledo uh, at the IG qualifier, so very excited for that. But to me, this game is best at 75. Uh, again, that's personal preference. You may love it at 100. I love it at all points. I've been playing a lot of 100 uh, through the online league. Uh, that's been offered and has been a total a total amount of fun. I have, I have to play some great people from all across the world, uh, which I would never have gotten the experience to do otherwise. But for me, uh, if I'm gonna if I'm going to, to have the option, I want to play 75. Uh, 100 is great, but uh, 75 is is where I want to be. Um, and Battleforge helps in that helps cement that quite a bit. So, what I'm looking for from from the community is is what do you want your next steamroller? Uh, for me, if I was to 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 lay it out, this, these are the things that I want. I want the removal of zones as we know it. I would like those to go to terrain elements, uh, where terrain elements are going to be what we what we use for scoring. For the beauty of the table, for the ease of uh, the player, all of that. I want to have a timing for victory check, meaning we check victory at a specific point in the game, preferably the end of the second player's turn. And we have a hierarchy of victory conditions. I want to see secondary and tertiary scoring introduced into Steamroller, and I'd like to see it with a slightly random element of what the selection for those are each game. Uh, I think the D3 tables are, are pretty much spot on. Those are things I would port immediately now into the Steamroller, even if we kept zones as they were, I would port that now. I think those type of things are, are great. I also want to see the imbalance scoring, meaning I don't want to have to track things on my side of the table. I don't want you to track things on your side of the table. I want to only track a main victory condition, and I want to track scoring at a neutral site, and I want to track scoring, which is elevated, at the enemy site. Meaning I want to highly incentivize me to get over to your side of the table and engage on that objective that is over on that side of the table, because in doing so, I get a major spike in victory points. That's what I want. Because that creates for a more dynamic fight. You have to think about how you're going to reserve on that side. You have to think about how you're going to attack that side. Because that will be the pivotal point where you determine whether you win or lose that particular game. Mix in the the secondary and tertiary objectives. And all of a sudden you have a very dynamic game. Whether you're playing 50, 75, 100... You're not having to play wide. You're having to play essentially in narrow spots that become very important, which is very much in in line with what I envision a, a proper way to proper way to war game if is if such a thing exists. But to me, that's what I want. I'd love to hear what you want. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Battle Forge. I'd like to know if you're if you've had a chance to play them, if you've looked at them. Uh, if you're excited for the Resurrection League, if you've had a chance to look at the Resurrection League scenarios, let me know. We're going to do a cast on those a little bit later as well. We'll be doing those as part of our battle reports. Please, please, please uh, subscribe uh, to us. We finally got over 100 subscribers. We are on the long march to 1,000 subscribers. So help us on our journey there. i looking forward to bringing more content to you. And thank you, as always, for listening to Tyrants on the Field. 
Hope you have a lot of fun. See you out there on the, on the game table. And if you're going to Toledo uh, on Saturday, I will see you there.